Hello guys and welcome to episode 3 of the court reporting series. So I do have two other, obviously, videos in this series. The first one was intro to court reporting, so what is court reporting, what is stenography. And then the second video that I did was a little bit more in depth about the stenography machine, the machine that court reporters use, the language that we use, how we write that fast. So I really suggest going to watch the videos in order because it will really make sense, especially if you are interested in becoming a court reporter or you are a student or you just really wanna know pretty in depth, I suggest going in order in this series for these to make the most sense. So for today's video, we are obviously going to be discussing all things about freelance court reporting, which is um, personally what I do. So there's kind of different terms that in this field we use for this, but the most widely known I would say is freelance reporting, um, deposition court reporting. Those are basically the two biggest terms. But what it means basically is that you're not working in court. You are freelance. You're working on your own. You're your own boss. You make your own schedule. You make your own hours. Um, you can make as little or as much as you want to make and so you're really really on your own and that's what i really like about this so we're just going to go into depth a little bit more about specifically freelance court reporting and what i do kind of the day in the life of a freelance court reporter i'll just kind of go through the whole process of doing that i'm not sure why i'm so bright but i am using natural light so just bear with me during this video if the light changes so first off i just kind of wanted to start off listing some pros and cons to doing freelance court reporting in kind of just to let you know what can help you make the decision if you want to be a court court reporter or if you want to go ahead and do freelance again i've said in the previous videos that there's multiple different things that you can do with court reporting but being an official in a courtroom and doing deposition freelance work those are the two most common uses of court reporting so those are the ones that i'm mainly going to talk about but today Obviously, I'm just going to go through kind of the pros and cons of freelance so that maybe it can just kind of help you decide, you know, sway you one way or the other. A lot of people when they're in school kind of think they know which one they want to do, whether they want to do court or freelance. But I kind of knew I wanted to do freelance, so I was in that same boat. But a lot of people don't know when they're in school a lot about either one. So that's why I kind of want to go into more depth. And I have never worked in court. I've done subbing in court. So I don't really feel qualified to go into too much depth of court. But my mom is a official court reporter and like I said I've subbed so maybe I can go into that in the future if you guys want to know more so comment down below if you want to know more about court so that I can do that so to me the biggest pro for freelance court reporting is you're your own boss and you make your own schedule that is number one um, and kind of just how I describe it to people is if I wanted to take a month off from work because I either wanted to go on vacation or not even a month just a week or two wanted to go on vacation or just you don't want to work I don't have to. I don't have to ask for sick days. I don't have to use sick days. I don't have to go to my boss and ask for those days off. I can plan around according to that. So that to me is one of the biggest pros. I can really move my schedule around. Even on days that I know Michael is off of work, sometimes I will try not to work that much so I can just move it around so I get to spend more time with him. Um, it's easy to make appointments with things because I can move things around. Now, if I have a deposition scheduled, you know, obviously you can't move that around. But if I know ahead of time, I don't don't want to work this week or these certain days then I can do that so it's like super super flexible um, I get to still keep my hobbies you know I get to work out every day and not that you can't when you have like a nine-to-five job but it's if you work a nine-to-five job you know it's a lot harder to kind of have those things within the day that you really want to do like work out or other hobbies it's hard to get those into the day when you have kind of a punch in punch out job so yeah I would say that that is like the biggest pro and one of the reasons one of the main reasons why I chose that is for when we also do have kids I will be able to be more flexible with my time and be a little bit more involved with them versus me working in court just for my like lifestyle I feel like I will be able to be more involved with them if I'm doing freelance. Another pro for deposition work is you get to work a lot from home. So I would say that like 70 to 80% of my work is from home. And if you do a lot of Zoom depositions, then that can go up in percentage because obviously you're taking the Zoom depositions from home. I really prefer in-person depositions because I just feel like my work product is better at the end of the day. If I am in person taking depositions in person, I do take Zoom depositions, but I try to take mostly in person. So yeah, that's kind of 
most of my work is from home because I'll go take the deposition and then I come home and work on it and I'll get into kind of the process of that in a little bit. These are just pros and cons. So most of my days, I actually do not wear makeup and I'm in sweats or PJs just kind of working from home and I really love that. I get to be with my dogs. You know, in the future, I'll get to be with kids too. So I just feel like that is another really, really big pro is getting to do it from home. The last pro that I'm gonna talk about, which there's so many little pros and ins and outs of it, but these are like the three major ones that I really wanted to talk about but the last major pro that I would say is pay and this can also go into the con category so I'll talk about that but you can really make as much as you want to pretty much doing freelance now there's a bunch of different ways you can do it in the sense of you can go take the deposition and then you can outsource the editing process and I'll go into that in a second um, or you can do that editing process on your own and obviously you will make more if you don't outsource it because you obviously have to pay those people that you're getting to outsource your jobs um, so I actually do a hundred percent of the work myself besides using court reporting firm to schedule things but I scope and proofread my work but yeah you can pretty much schedule as many depositions as you want or as little as you want but um, um, you know, if there's a trip coming up that I know we have or if there's a big expense coming up that I know we have I could work a lot more if I wanted to and yes You're kind of more stressed out and working seven days a week But if you want to do that you can so I, I think that that's a big pro because there is you know Usually when you have a job you have a set salary or a set hourly pay and you can't really change that You know from month to month based on your budget and stuff. But I feel like for me, if there's something I know that we're really working towards, I could work a little bit harder or work a little bit more and make more. <laughs> okay, so those are the pros. And like I said, there's a lot more pros, but those are like the really, really big ones. So now I'm gonna go into just a few of the cons and they kind of contrast with what I was talking about. But the first con that I will talk about is you have no medical, no 401k, no retirement benefits. So, and that's kind of obvious when you are self-employed, when you work for yourself, you're not working for a company who is paying those benefits for you and then taking a little bit of your check from that. So, you know, your check is a little bit more, but then you also have to pay taxes at the end of the year that is not already previously taken out of each check, like usually happens when you work for a company. So you have to set that aside yourself. So pretty much everything is manual. The best way that I handle that, I'll just tell you now in case, you know, you are a freelance or you want to go into freelance every time I get paid from a deposition um, I will put a certain percentage of that check away into like another separate account that I have that's strictly just for like taxes so that when I go do my taxes at the end of the year I have that amount already set aside and I usually try to put a little bit higher of percentage than I really need to so that I can make my own return tax return at the end of the year because if you work for yourself you always have to pay taxes you will never get a return but if I'm putting away a higher percentage, then sometimes I can kind of make myself a return. So that's kind of how I do that. So you do have to put things away yourself. And then, yeah, you have no health care. You have no um, 401k or anything like that. So you do have to go manually do that yourself kind of separately. That's like the biggest con is I wish like, you know, healthcare, private healthcare is just so expensive. And I do wish like there was some way that I could do that, but just can't really do that at the moment. But um, yeah, we've learned to like work with it, but that is probably the biggest con. So another con I would say is time management. So since you are working from home a lot, you do have to manage your time. And I feel like I will never be perfect at this. Like I will never feel like I have it perfectly balanced, you know, just it's life. But I do feel like you need to manage your time at least pretty well most days. And it, it also depends on your workload. So, you know, if, if you have really big jobs on your backlog, you really need to time management pretty well. If you have some small jobs or you're kind of, you know, just chilling a little bit on work, you're not too overwhelmed, then, you know, some days you can work maybe half days or something like that. But yeah, I feel like I struggle with time management because I do try to juggle a lot of different things, like even just being consistent with YouTube. That actually takes a lot of time too, so I have to like manage that throughout the week, throughout my days with work as well. So time management, if you're really not good at time management and you don't like working from home and you'd rather like someone tell you what to do every day, then maybe like freelance wouldn't be for you. But I mean, I, so, I still say give it a shot because you know, you could surprise yourself. But yeah, if you really don't want to like make any of that schedule yourself, then maybe it's not for you. But I really like that side of it. Sometimes I like the challenge. And again, I like the flexibility. So the last con that I will talk about 
but again kind of how i said earlier is pay sometimes is when you go to a deposition you never know how long it's going to be you never know the turnaround time that they're wanting they could want it the next day they could want it normal turnaround time so you get paid more and i'll talk about this in more detail in a minute but you get paid more the quicker turnaround time they want it usually they just want it in the normal turnaround time which is about two weeks but if they say you know i want a rush in the next day or three days or whatever um the rate does go up from there so obviously a same day or next day rush is a lot higher than regular turnaround time so um also you could walk into a really really short depo that lasts 30 minutes or even a deposition where the witness doesn't even show up and then you get a minimum set pay for that but um you could walk into a six hour deposition or you know six hours on the record so really you could be there longer than that but they have a time limit of six hours on the record for questioning but yeah, you can either be there all day or 10 minutes. You just don't know. So that could be a con. Sometimes I feel like that's exciting because I don't, you know, I don't have the same thing every day. But a lot of people don't like that. And that does determine pay as well. Because obviously a shorter deposition is not going to pay you as much as a really big deposition. Because we get paid um, per page and also the time that we are there. So those are just some quick pros and cons that honestly I kind of came with at the top of my head. So there may be more and I can talk about those future or just comment down below if you have pros and cons with freelance or even court. Um, I'm always open to talk about more of those. But now I'm going to kind of talk about how you get scheduled deposition and how the process of taking the deposition and turning it in goes. So first and foremost, once you decide that you want to be a freelance court reporter and you take the state exam and you pass, pretty much you'll start getting emails right away because your information will be on some kind of website. At least that's how it was for me in the state of Texas. Um, I started getting emails from court reporting firms to um, use me for depositions because we are so, so needed. It is crazy how many depositions there are out there. You pretty much have an infinite number of amount of work if you want to. I also knew that there was some firms in the Austin, Texas area that I did want to work for. Like I said, my mom's a court reporter, so I had a little bit of networking already because she knew some firms that she used to work for or she just knew they had a good reputation. So I suggest maybe looking around at some firms within your area that have a good reputation that pay on a timely basis, that pay well, that are maybe willing to work with your rates as well. Um, and you know, I just would always say, test them out because there has been other firms that I've worked for where they've been okay, but then there's been a few issues with maybe pay or I don't feel like I'm getting compensated enough with their rates that I just stopped working for them slowly. Um, not really any bad blood or anything like that ever. It's pretty simple when it comes to it, but really you just kind of, um, you know, find some firms that you really like and you'll start working for the same attorneys sometimes with those firms and you really like those attorneys. So that's, it kind of just happens organically and it takes time. There's two firms in the Austin area that I really like to work with and really those are the only two firms that I work for, just two, but they keep me busy enough that I don't need to use other firms. I will maybe every once in a while, but really it's just only two firms that I work for and I know them pretty well now. Maybe I should say really quick what a court reporting firm is, but basically it's just a company that's kind of like the third party. So they will reach out to a list of court reporters that they have and that they work with and they will send out like a blast email and say, hey, an attorney has contacted us to schedule a court reporter for deposition on this day, this time, who wants it? And so that's when I'll look at my calendar and if I'm like, yes, I need another deposition that week or something like that, then I'll be like, I can take that depot. Then they will send me all the paperwork for that depot. I will put it on my calendar and they will let the attorney know we have scheduled a court reporter for that deposition. And then when that day comes, I will go take that deposition kind of representing that court reporting firm that I am with for that day, if that makes sense. So I'm still self-employed, but I'm kind of contracted out for that specific deposition with whatever firm scheduled it. And so they do get a small percentage of your check, but not that you have to do anything with. They already get, they already take out their percentage when they, when the firm pays you. So you do get paid by the court reporting firm, you know, so they'll bill out to the attorney for the transcript. The attorney will pay the firm keeps usually I would say that it's like 70 30 so I will get 70 percent and the firm keeps 30 percent um, but really you don't need to worry much about that I would just say I would just suggest maybe asking the firm what percentage they take at the beginning before working with them but I would say them keeping 30 percent is pretty normal and anyone let me know if you have heard of anything else crazy different but that's just what I've heard so that's how you go about scheduling a deposition um pretty pretty straightforward there's nothing really too intricate with it um with your rates sometimes maybe before working for a firm you can ask for their rates so when I say rates I mean per page rate so 
and it is kind of confusing because different areas have different per page rates but i just kind of go off what i've maybe seen other court reporters have in this area and also honestly what my mom and what courts kind of rates are at the time and sometimes i'll ask the firm what their rates are and i'll like kind of compare different firms and just to make sure that my specific rates or my rates that i think i should be getting are around the same every firm is different so they may calculate something different like they may pay um per diem which means like i don't know why they call it per diem even though it's like per hour but they may pay your hour that you're at the court at the deposition differently or they may not even pay per diem so i would make sure you're only working with a firm that pays you per diem or you suggest that they pay you per diem because you need to get paid for the time that you're there. So now I'm going to talk about kind of the deposition process. So I will go into a deposition with my paperwork and the firm will usually send you a notice, which is basically, I'm sure everyone's kind of seen a notice. Maybe I'll put like a picture of an example in here, but basically it's the style of the case. So it will have the case name. So so-and-so versus so-and-so in whatever county. And then it will have the witness name for that day and the date and time and all that stuff. So, you know, you know, all the info where you need to be, what time. And you also usually have the attorney's names on that notice and their information, which is really helpful. I also have a deposition information sheet that I will link down below because this is so helpful to me. And I'm not gonna go into depth of it right now of what everything means on that sheet. But you, if you are interested in using that or have questions about that, please DM me on Instagram or comment, I don't care. But um, I don't wanna go into depth right now because it is a little bit intricate involved in depositions. And usually you don't know what everything means unless you're working in depositions. But I have a sheet that I use for every deposition that I fill out. I've made it myself and I will link it down below if you wanna use it as well. So I have that little sheet and I'll fill out some of the info on there. And then there's obviously some questions that I try to ask at the beginning, like if, if this is gonna be a rush, if they have any trials or hearings upcoming soon that I need to know about to where this transcript needs to be turned around quickly. Um, you know, things like that. I never ask about length of depo. Um, maybe I've done that like once and twice in my whole career just with personal things, but I tr really try not to ask that because I just want them to know that I'm there for them. I'm there for the length of time that they need me. I try not to double book depositions. I know that sometimes um, court reporters will book one in the morning and one in the afternoon. Um, I won't do that unless I know for sure like the first one's going to be done, but yeah, I wouldn't really double book yourself because then you get in a pickle and attorneys don't really like if you're like, hey, I gotta go even though your deposition's still going. So I don't really suggest that. So then um, the attorneys will fill out their forms that they have for me, basically just asking how they would like their transcript. They can order like a paper copy or an electronic copy and always the attorney noticing the deposition will obviously have purchase a transcript and then the other side can purchase copies and sometimes you can get a lot more copies if it's like 0 and 3 or 0 and 4 if there's a lot of attorneys involved in that case so a lot of different parties and that's where you kind of rack up the money if it's a big case it can be really intimidating but you can make a lot more money for not much more work just because they more attorneys want more copies of the transcript. So then we will begin the deposition and you swear the witness in at the deposition and then you go ahead and start just writing what they say and I do interrupt quite a bit. Well, I wouldn't say quite a bit, but I am a person who's not scared to interrupt. Of course, at the beginning, I was scared to interrupt, but I feel like it is so important because if you don't understand what they're saying there at the time when you're in person or even through Zoom when you're live taking it, how are you going to later when you're editing going to be able to understand what they're saying? You know, so I always stop and, you know, I've had once or twice the attorneys not really like that. I'm asking questions, but if they want a good work product, then I need to do what I need to do. So don't be afraid to speak up and maybe learn some ways to say it. I try to sound assertive, but not rude, but I feel like sometimes when I listen back to myself, I don't sound assertive at all. So I need to work on that. But, you know, if they start talking all over each other, I usually will put my hands up so that they know that I am not writing on my machine anymore so that hopefully that gives them stop while I'm talking I'll put my hands up and I'll say excuse me excuse me I, I need one at a time or something like that um I also need to work on not saying I'm sorry excuse me I try not to say I'm sorry just because you know I'm not trying to apologize for stopping but I don't know just kind of naturally whatever comes out of your mouth and again if you have more questions about that let me know but that's pretty much it I'll take down what they say and then when I'm done, I always back everything up. And you know, if you guys wanna know more about the equipment and how I set up for a deposition, that can be a whole nother video because I'm already talking forever, so I can't get into that, into this one. But if you wanna know a little bit more about setup, let me know and maybe I can do a video on that. So the next part that you do is when working on this specific transcript, the deposition we have just taken, is I will come home and when I'm ready to work on that transcript, I will pull it up onto my computer using my software and I use Eclipse software um and there's a few different 
things out there. I know a lot of people use Case Catalyst too, but I use Eclipse. And then now begins the process of scoping, which basically means that you are listening to what you recorded that day and you're just listening to it honestly all again and going through it with your transcript and just seeing if you've made any mistakes, like you may have pressed something wrong so a word didn't come out right or you may have misspelled something, maybe someone's name. Um, you can start to add punctuation here. You can, you know, start to create more paragraphs that you want that you hadn't created before. You can fix certain speakers if you accidentally identified the wrong speaker, things like that. Kind of fixing the big errors that you have on your transcript. Now, a lot of people, most freelance court reporters that I know, actually, I don't know anyone who does 100% of their work themselves, but most court reporters outsource this so they will have what is called a scopist so they will send what they took while they're at the deposition they will send that to the scopist and the scopist will go through the transcript and do it and really that saves time for the court reporter to be able to go and take more depositions which yes that can actually get you more money and so i know a lot of reporters who make quite a bit more money than i do because they outsource everything sorry my thing just cut off ran out of time but I can't remember exactly what I was saying, but I think I was saying that court reporters outsource things a lot, especially scoping, and you can make a lot more money doing that way, but also you don't really know sometimes your, what your transcript looks like when you send it out to the court reporting firm to send to the attorney, and that just scares the bejesus out of me. I like to really know what my work product looks like, and I kind of enjoy the process of the workload at home. A lot of reporters don't like that. They'd rather go take more depositions. I prefer the at home portion of working on it versus going to take the actual depositions, if that makes sense. So after you are done scoping or getting it scoped and let's say that your scopist sends it back or you're done scoping now, now is the process of proofreading, which is just what it sounds like. You are now going through like a fine tooth comb, making sure that every word is correct and the punctuation is how you want it. A lot of reporters outsource this as well. They will have proofreaders, so sometimes they'll send it out to the proofreader and they'll send it back, and then they will turn their trans transcript in, a lot of times not even looking at it again. I, I just, I can't get behind that for me personally. Again, I wanna know what my work product looks like. I've had attorneys compliment me on my transcripts, so I just wanna keep doing what I'm doing. And you know, I'm not perfect, obviously. I know I've sent jobs out that I'm sure have errors, but at the end of the day, I'm proud of the transcript that I have sent out and I know what it looks like. So how I proofread is I actually print my transcript out versus just reading on the computer because I feel like you can really miss stuff when you're reading on the computer. So I print it out on paper and I just have like a red pen or pink pen and I'll just proofread. So when it's a proofreading day, it's a pretty chill day. I like to do that like outside or you know, just different spots throughout the house, but that's really fun to do that because it can be really relaxing or going to a coffee shop and doing it there too. So after proofreading, I will um, go back to my computer now and enter in the mistakes that I have found during proofreading. So if I wanted to add a, add a comma or change the spelling or something, I'll go to that page and fix it. And then after that, you add your front pages of the transcript and your certification pages of your transcript and then you send the transcript over to the court reporting firm and they produce it and send it out to the attorneys and that's really the whole process of like working on a deposition so you do transcribe um everything that you take when you do freelance and you do depositions when you work in court you don't have to transcribe everything so you may be writing all day with a bunch of different hearings and you don't necessarily have to transcribe all of that, but when you do trials and there's appeals, obviously you have like thousands of pages just to transcribe. So um, a lot of people don't like depositions because you do have to transcribe everything. So maybe that could be another con, but I actually prefer that because then you get to build your dictionary and things like that quicker and so your writing becomes better in the sense of like editing um maybe not necessarily skill wise because in court i find that a little bit more difficult sometimes not all the time if you have a really hard deposition they're just killer but yeah so you get to build your dictionary and build your software and i think that that's really cool for growing your career so just quickly how we get paid, and I think this will be the last thing that I talk about today, but how we get paid is mainly per page. So if you go take a deposition and it is 100 pages, and let's say that your page rate is $5, well you get $500 
for that specific transcript but then you also get your per diem hopefully you're charging that so your hourly i have a two hour minimum so whatever my hourly is even if i'm there for 10 minutes i have a two hour minimum that i charge and um let's say that i charge 30 dollars an hour for that then i will get paid 60 dollars and let's say that I was only there for two hours for the 100 page transcript well then it would be i am now getting 560 dollars for that deposition but let's say there was an own two so there was another attorney there who wants a copy and again this is kind of controversial because i don't know how everywhere does it but from what i've heard is that the copy order is one third of the original price because always the original attorney the taking attorney gets charged the most and that the copy attorney is about one third of the price let's do 500 divided by three because i am not good at math i'm good at words so 500 divided by three is 166 dollars 166 dollars plus 560 so you are making about 726 dollars off that job and there could be more copies or you could charge more per diem or you could be getting paid more than just a third per copy it really just depends on the firm and depends on you but for that you know short ish step i don't know 100 pages is a pretty good length of a deposition you're probably there more than two hours and then also you probably spending a few days working on it at home about 730 dollars for that deposition i hope that makes sense again if you have questions let me know but then if there is rushes on top of that, the per page rate actually shoots up. So sometimes I really prefer rushes because it kind of is pressure on you to finish it fast and you get paid more. So, um, you know, if it is a three day rush, let's say you get paid instead of $5 per page, you're now getting paid seven or $8 per page and it's still a hundred page job, then you're getting paid 700, $800 for just that one one original order and then your per diem obviously is what it is and then also if there's copies it will be one third about of that so you do get paid more for rushes but you know it's a lot more stressful but you do get paid more so that's how you get paid that's it and that's why every month it's so different a lot of people ask me well how much do you make and i'm like it is all over the place like i cannot give you a number i can give you a roundabout of what i feel like is a good feel for me with the amount of pages that i do per month so i try to keep track of the amount of pages i do per month because i feel like that can help me gauge whether i'm working quite a bit or not working enough not making enough um and you do get paid you know quite a bit after you turn the job in like two to three weeks after you turn the job in so just be prepared for that it can take a while for money to start rolling in so just make sure you're sending things out consistently and then money is coming in consistently and you do get paid through the court reporting firm at the end of the year you will get to 99s for each firm that you work for and so it's kind of cool to see how all that adds up with the different firms that you work with i think that's all i'm going to talk about today again i could go on forever about this um but i feel like i went into pretty good depth of what a freelance court reporter does again as always let me know if you have any questions i'm very open to answering them and there's just so much involved in this that there really is endless amounts of questions let me know what other videos you would like to see from this series and thank you for watching this series i hope you are enjoying it and i hope to see you guys soon